I want to welcome you back to our April Bible study titled The Passion of Christ. Today's lesson is The View of Christ's Cross. You know, we've been thinking about leading up to Easter season, Jesus on the cross, and I preached a sermon series called Approaching the Cross. And I was thinking during the preparation of those lessons, I wonder how those who stood at Calvary and watched Jesus die felt about what they saw. You know, today we can sing so casually that I will cherish the old rugged cross or, or say beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. And you know, without blinking an eye, we can sing Jesus keep me near the cross, bring its scenes before me. But the question is, could those who gathered around Calvary have sung bring its scenes before me? I suspect that as they saw what happened at that place of horror, they might have said, take these scenes away from me. I never want to think of them again. Well, in Luke's gospel, chapter 23, verses 44 through, th uh, uh, 44 through 49, Luke's gospel tells us this. It says, by this time it was noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the captain of the Roman soldiers handling the execution saw what had happened, he praised God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw all that had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. You know, dear friends, yes, I'm sure it was a day they wanted to forget, but they didn't forget. They began to meet together and they remembered his death every first day of the week. In fact, the Apostle Paul would even say in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, dear friends, as the facts began to come together for them, these disciples, they began to think of Calvary as often as they could. And you know, we too must make a, a pilgrimage to Calvary. That's why I uh, preached recently over the series Approaching the Cross. And you know, if we are going to see what they saw there at Golgotha, then we are going to have to look. We're going to have to look at the cross, even though the scenes they are not pleasant, but we really must look upon the view at Christ's cross. Only there can we grasp certain essential truths. Only there can the most important facts of history be presented to us in a dramatic and an unforgettable way. So let's jump in together and let's take a look at the cross of Christ. First, we see there Christ's righteousness was despised. Of course, the despisement was by the Jewish people and their leaders that were there that day. They had been waiting for the Holy One of God. They had been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. But when Jesus came and when they beheld his holiness, they despised it. How sad that many people in Jesus' day were unable to accept the very one that they had been waiting and praying for. Now, not only did the Jewish leaders and many of the Jewish people despise Christ's righteousness, Christ's righteousness was also despised by the Romans. They were not involved, of course, in the religious debate over Jesus, yet they found cause on that fateful day to mock Jesus. Was there something in Jesus' attitude that the callous Romans could not understand? You know, these Romans admired power, and perhaps they couldn't appreciate this man who stood as a sheep stands quietly before its shearers. Of course, Christ's righteousness was even despised by one of his own disciples, a man we know as Judas. Judas was at one time a trusted confidant. He saw Christ as one, though, to be bartered. How ironic that the one most worthy of our highest praise was subjected to our lowest humiliation. We shouldn't be surprised that Christ was despised. In fact, Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Christ that this would happen. It says in Isaiah 53 and verse 3 that he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. 
we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. You know, people tend to hate those who are better than themselves. People look at a sinless Christ, then at their own sin, and instead of coming to Christ so that they might be cleansed of their own sinfulness, they despise the one who can save them. I remember when Mahatma Gandhi, the great advocate of nonviolent protest, he was gunned down by an assassin. Someone said, now we know how dangerous it is to be good. Dear friends, we see that point even clearer in Christ. The only place this world has for people like Jesus is on crosses. We have no room for him any place else. Well, we've looked at how Christ's righteousness was despised. The second view that we see when we gaze upon the cross is we see Christ's righteousness displayed there. You know, here in the most trying time of his life, we see Jesus' holiness shine through. Moments of trial, they tend to accent the best and worst in a person, and that's certainly true of Jesus. In fact, in Christ, we see Jesus' goodness so clearly that we stand in awe. The fact is we do because there is only goodness in Jesus Christ. Now, how was his righteousness on display on the cross? Well, first off, his righteousness was displayed in his attitude towards his enemies. Would anyone have blamed Jesus for some few sarcastic words to those who conspired to put him to death? And yet Jesus showed only compassion for his enemies, and he asked the Father for their forgiveness. It reminds me of a time earlier in his ministry when Jesus had talked about loving enemies. You know, we might have thought that his words were an unattainable ideal if he hadn't shown us how to love our enemies while on the cross. We also see his righteousness was displayed in his attitude towards his friends. You know, when we are in a time of great need, we hope our friends will support us. But at Calvary, we do not see Jesus' friends supporting him, do we? We see Jesus supporting his friends. And if we look closely enough, we see that as his body weighed heavily on that cross, he was indeed supporting all of us. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says this. He says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. You know, some have said Jesus was not truly like us because he did not experience sin. But the fact is, he did experience the wrath against sin. You know, on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. He experienced the weight of all the sins of the world at once. Just think of that for a moment. A man who had never committed sin, confronted with the sins of all the world. Jesus' righteousness was displayed for the whole world on the cross of Calvary. We also see his righteousness was displayed in his attitude towards suffering. We look at the cross and we see Jesus accepted suffering, didn't he? He realizes that no one can escape it. Jesus did not come to the cross cheerfully, of course. If he had, we would have wondered about his sanity. No one enjoys suffering, not even the Lord. But he did, however, accept suffering. He faced it in a way that inspires us all. We also see Christ's righteousness was displayed in his attitude towards death. You know, Jesus wanted to avoid Calvary, but it wasn't because he was afraid to die. He might have been reluctant to face the pain of death. He might have wanted to live longer, but he wasn't afraid to die. Listen to his final words. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What a beautiful way to look at death. When we die, we are placing ourselves in the hands of the Father. We can look at Calvary and see the actions of Christ. Surely we are led to say as we look there, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We aren't the only ones to be affected by the scenes of Calvary. We have seen Christ's righteousness despised. We have seen Christ's righteousness displayed there. And now, thirdly, we see Christ's righteousness declared, declared. Where do we see Christ's righteousness declared? 
Well, first off, we see Christ's righteousness was declared by Pilate, the Roman prelate, which was in charge of the area of Judea where this happened. Remember Pilate's words. He said, I find no fault in him. Though he did not, of course, as far as we know, believe in Jesus, Pilate knew a good person when he saw one. And though he did not have the courage to set Christ free, he could not bear to judge this Holy One of God. In John chapter 19, we read that Pilate had a sign, a placard placed above Jesus' head and written on it in three different languages was this message, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. When he did this, the Jews pro protested to Pilate and they said this in John 19, 21, change it from the King of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. You know, when I think about that moment, I realized it's a very puny, but nonetheless truthful sign that was nailed over Jesus's head. But realize the might uh, is not in the sign, but in the person who holds it. If the sign itself, the placard seems inconsequential, its message was not. If the might of the master seemed overwhelmed by the meanness of the cross, it is his power that turned that instrument of execution from a symbol of defeat into an emblem of triumph. You know, the small sign did not hide the gigantic vigor of God. For bleeding as his body may have been, there was the strength to redeem you and me. Of course, we know Christ's righteousness was declared by the centurion as well. Remember the centurion at the foot of the cross. He said, surely this was a righteous man. Now, admittedly, his faith was partial and, and, and incomplete, but he was strongly touched by the man on the cross. It's very interesting. I've heard some suggest that the man who led the crucifixion crew and declared that at the foot of the cross was none other than Cornelius, who would later be saved in Acts chapter 10. You know, even nature on that Good Friday long ago declared Christ's righteousness. When Jesus died, all of God's fury was set loose upon Calvary. And from a harmony of the gospel accounts, we learn that there was a great earthquake. Rocks were split in two. The, the sun stopped shining. The tombs later broke open. And the bodies of many holy people were raised to life after Jesus was. That was the power of the Spirit, of course, then. But it was as if before on Good Friday, God's anger could be held back no more. The temple veil was torn in two, and surely a nagging thought crept into the minds there that day. What have we done? You know, God didn't finish there. Three days later came the ultimate declaration of Christ's righteousness. The Father raised him from the dead. And this, the most dramatic and startling event in history was done so that God could say once again, this is my beloved son. Only after the resurrection did the meaning of the cross become clear. This Jesus and his execution might have faded from memory without the resurrection. But after he had risen, they could look back on the cross and comprehend it. So to conclude our Bible lesson together here this morning, we remember that the disciples took this message with them into all the world. They declared to the world what they had seen. And down through the centuries, the message of Jesus, who conquered sin and death, has been passed on. And so it comes to all, a compulsion really, even to go to Calvary, to see Jesus on the cross. You know, people today long to go to Jerusalem and see the place where Jesus died. And I understand from those who have gone there that it is indeed a moving experience. But you know, it is far more important to come spiritually to Calvary. After our spiritual pilgrimage to Calvary, we will leave changed. The fact is, at Calvary, our eyes grow moist and our throat becomes choked with emotion. And maybe then we can understand the spirit of that great hymn that says this, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. May God bless you this week.